I hope you're able to focus on uh, the images that I brought with me. They're not going to compete with the caryatids over there. Um, so I, too, remember very clearly where I was that day, and I think... Um, it was one of those defining moments uh, for a generation, like defining moments that uh, generations before us had. And I was living in uh, New York at the time. Uh, I had been living there for about three years, freshly graduated from uh, architecture school in Atlanta. I moved up to New York in 1999. And that morning, um, my wife actually left for work early in lower Manhattan, and I was still at home listening to the radio when I heard an announcer in a shaky voice say uh, that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. And of course, I thought it must have been an accident in a small plane. And I walked across our apartment towards First Avenue and looked out the window and I could see smoke coming up from one of the towers. And so I grabbed my camera and went up to the rooftop of our apartment building uh, where I witnessed the second plane flying south down the Hudson, turning around and smashing into the South Tower. And it was a, a horrible sight to, to behold. Um, a moment that obviously um, is seared in my memory. Um, and, in, and immediately I understood that this was no accident. I tried to, uh, I rushed down, tried to get my wife on the phone. Of course, all the circuits were down and ended up walking jumping on my bike, going to Lower Manhattan, and then we walked back up together. And by the time I returned to my apartment about three, four hours later, those two towers were gone. Um, and I think, you know, the events of that day affected many people personally. I know they affected me uh, deeply because of my presence there in New York, but I don't think you had to be there in New York for, for that to have an effect on you. And, um, and I think it is because of that deep personal impact that I began to start thinking about the design of a memorial a few weeks after the attack. And I ended up sketching this drawing. Um, and the idea here was the idea of, that somehow the surface of the river would be torn open, forming two square voids. I could not imagine at the time actually building at the World Trade Center site. It was a six-story high pile of rubble, bodies were still being pulled out of it. And so I went to the Hudson River nearby uh, and suggested that at the North Cove Marina by Battery Park City, these two voids would be placed in the river somehow. And you can't really um, create a void in water. You could carve ice, but not water. But it was an image that was stuck in my mind, this notion of rupture and absence and ongoing loss that time does not erase, that as water flows into these voids, they remain empty, they do not fill up. And uh, in the recession that followed um, the attacks in New York, I found myself out of work and with plenty of time on my hands to take the sketch and to turn it into a small sculpture, a small fountain. Um, that materialized that idea that I had sketched of that, that surface of the water sort of torn open, torn open, forming two square voids. And I took it up to the rooftop of my apartment building and photographed it against the skyline of New York, imagining um, the view across perhaps from New Jersey, across the Hudson, and the absence of the towers and the skyline being reflected and mirrored in the foreground in these two voids. And this took about a year, that process of sketching and drawing and studying and eventually building this model. And then I set it aside. Um, during this time, I was also busy trying to find uh, employment, um, eventually succeeded. And um, the city itself was struggling with the recovery uh, after the attack. And it became a very public a conversation. Architecture and urban planning kind of moved to the forefront in a way that they had never been discussed in New York before. Um, as a result of that conversation, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, an entity that was created to sort of take federal funds and disperse them to the redevelopment of Lower Manhattan after the attacks, was formed and it took on itself the responsibility uh, to create a master plan for the site. 
they were not the only entity that was in control of the site. In fact, there was no clear control or hierarchy there. The first master plan for the site was actually created by uh, an architecture firm that was hired by the Port Authority. The Port Authority is actually the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It's a bi-state agency whose board of governors is elected by the governors of New York and New Jersey and usually end up being in power for many years longer than the governors themselves. Uh, and so it has a certain autonomy. It's almost like a small enclave in the middle of lower Manhattan that has its own rules and regulations. In the top left of the image, you see the area that was once the World Trade Center. It's a 16-acre site. And in the 1960s, uh, most of the urban fabric that had existed there previously, and this is a very old part of what was once uh, New Amsterdam and then New York, um, Wall Street, which is a couple of blocks south of here, was once the northern edge of the city and it moved forward. Uh, whoops, Church Street, which is right about here, was once the shoreline, and that shoreline progressively moved out over time onto landfill. Um, but that 16 acre site, that super block, was created in the 1960s. And when Daniel Liebskin was uh, selected to develop a master plan for the site, he wanted to bring some of that urban fabric back to the site. So he brought Greenwich Street back to the site, which was running north-south through the site, and he brought Fulton Street running east-west. So that took that 16-acre superblock and subdivided it into four unequal quadrants, setting aside about eight acres for the memorial and for cultural buildings, and another eight acres for office towers, which would ring the site. So the idea would, would be that you would replace all 10 million square feet of office space in these new towers and that you would set aside a site for a memorial. And I think, you know, very often you heard the phrase, you know, the memorial comes first, but I think what also came at first order was also the restoration of office space to the site, not just the memorial. It was both of them moved together. That master plan and these images that were created along with it served as the basis for the competition that was launched for the memorial. And it was uh, at the time that I saw this, I had thought again about you know what I had previous, previously had sketched a year and a half before that. And although I agreed with a lot of ideas that the master plan had in them, such as bringing Fulton Street and Greenwich Street back, when I looked at the area that was set aside for the memorial, I felt that it was going down the wrong track. In many ways, and here you see that area designated in sort of a green lawn with the two lighter green squares where the towers had once stood. And so this was the brief, and the competition was like, you know, what would you want to put where that green is? But everything else should stay as it is. And I looked at it, and one of the things that bothered me the most about it was actually that it felt completely disconnected from the city. If the rest of the site was being made whole again, stitched back into the urban fabric of the city, this was set aside. It was 20 feet, I'm sorry, 20 meters, 60 feet below the surrounding streets and sidewalks. And, the only, and you had a couple of ramps which brought you down to that lower level. And on two sides, there was a series of buildings, one bridging over the North Tower footprint, one cantilevering over the other footprint, that essentially blocked the site from the rest of the city, shielded it, visually hid it. And I could understand that impulse, that idea that you would shelter something like this as if it's fragile and that it couldn't be part of New York. But I thought of my own experiences in New York in the days and weeks that followed the attack and how important public space was to the recovery of the city. As a student of architecture, I'd always had a sort of cerebral understanding of the importance of public space, civic space for a civil society. But it wasn't until the days of the, after the attack when I got to stand side by side with complete strangers at places like Washington Square and Union Square that I understood it emotionally and emphatically that civic space has, um, public space has such an important value. And I think it is precisely the public spaces of New York City, whether it was just a street corner or a big public square, that allowed New Yorkers to come together in the aftermath of that attack, support one another, and respond with courage and compassion and not with fear and hatred. And certainly there were instances where you did see this, you know, these emotions flash up here or there. But for the most part, I think New York, New Yorkers reacted admirably. And um, 
if you would have told me, you know, a week before the attack that I would go out, buy an American flag and hang it in the window of my apartment building, I would have said, no, come on. I felt like a stranger in New York. But after that, I felt for the first time like a New Yorker. I felt a sense of community that came from being able to stand with other people in public and respond as a community. And when I looked at this image, I felt that that was a negation to that experience that I had of public space. It was open, but it was not a public space. It was not part of the city. And almost in a polemical way, as, uh, like, as one might write a letter to the editor, I, respond, I decided to respond to the competition brief by ignoring the rules and sending in a very different proposal. And this was a sketch that I did in June of 2003. Uh, the competition deadline was June 30th, 2003. Uh, I know because the last few days I didn't sleep. Uh, and on this sketch on the right-hand side, you see a plaza, a very simple plaza bounded by four streets, uh, Fulton to the north, Liberty to the south, West on the west side, and Greenwich on the right. And on that plaza, two voids, those voids which for me had previously been in the river, I tried to bring them to the site. And in bringing them to the site, obviously they changed in meaning. They were now marking the actual location of where these attacks happened. And then you see people gathered up around the voids, looking down into them, or gathered behind a waterfall, looking past the names through the water. This sketch led to this competition entry. It was a single board, 30 by 40 inches, an anonymous entry, um, as required by the guidelines, uh, one of uh, over 5,000 proposals which were sent in. Um, and you can see there was a text describing my competition entry. Most of it was dedicated to the description of the memorial um, and how it would function as a memorial. But the very last paragraph and the very last sentence on that last paragraph talks about creating an urban plaza that will benefit the residents of the city and their everyday lives on their way to work or play. And for me, it was important to end on that word play, to, emph to emphasize that although this is a memorial site and a proposal for a memorial, this also had to function as a living part of the city, that it should welcome people who work in this neighborhood, who are in no way different than the people who perished here on their way to it while they were at work. And it should be a place where people who live in this neighborhood feel welcome to. It should not become um, a sort of a place that excludes life and only welcomes that visitor that comes on that once in a lifetime pilgrimage to an important site like this. It's not a zero-sum game, that in fact the experience of being here, whether it is on a lunch break or for that once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage, is in fact enriched by the presence of others who are here for a very different reason than you are. So here you see that plaza raised up to meet the surrounding streets and sidewalks, these two large voids carved into it, and the voids needed the plaza in order to register. It had a sort of reciprocal relationship between them of solid and void. And then below, behind that waterfall, one would encounter the names. Uh, I found out in late 2003 that I was one of eight finalists that the jury selected for further development of the scheme. Um, and that further development was accompanied by meetings with both the jury and the LMDC, questions about my entry. And you can see the site as it looked back then in 2003. You can still see remnants of the parking levels which were below the plaza of the World Trade Center. You could see the slurry wall which had been built in the 60s to contain the entire site. And in the recovery effort, which ended at the lowest, found at the lowest basement, on the top of the foundation slab, it unveiled this wall which had been hidden for 30, 40 years. Um, a wall that um, had a tremendous amount of hydrostatic pressure on it. The Hudson River is nearby and the fact that it didn't collapse uh, was a remarkable feat of engineering and something that appealed to Daniel Leapskind. He wanted to actually highlight that wall as, as an artifact of strength and survival and resilience. And I think for that reason, he wanted to sort of keep that site excavated 60 feet below street level. But I thought there must be another way of doing this. This wall could be exhibited within a museum below a memorial plaza, which is exactly what it is, uh, how it is today. And I came across these cut-off steel columns, these enormous steel columns which connected the foundation to the tower. And in the recovery effort, they had been torch-cut 
at the top of that foundation slab. And there was something incredibly moving about uh, seeing this, uh, the sort of the absence of the steel column that was here. And I, I snapped this picture, and I see in it a lot of what I hope this project does. It, it gives you a way to see what is no longer there, not by putting something anew there that actually hides the absence, but by highlighting the absence. As one of eight finalists, I had about a month, uh, six weeks, to develop my plans further, develop drawings and uh, animations and models, and respond to questions and concerns by the jury. And these materials came from that period. You see that um, procession down underground up to the edge of that waterfall to encounter the names. And this moment to me was a, a charged and powerful moment, uh, a moment of encountering the thousands of names uh, at the edge of this enormous void. Uh, you come up to a, a line, up to a threshold that you can only walk up to but not cross. It's a line that separates uh, the living from the dead and it's a line uh, that is um, imbued with, uh, with meaning. And you return up to the plaza transformed by this jury, by this journey. I showed these materials, this model to the jury, and they said, you know, you talk about the memorial being a place that welcomes everybody, but this landscape looks very austere and bleak to us, as if it could only support memorial uses. And um, how could you address this concern that we have? And I was very concerned that if I came in there with a very ornate pattern uh, of a landscape design, think of the ceiling overhead, for example, it would obscure the clarity of that gesture of the flat plane and the two voids. And I uh, struggled uh, with how could I address this concern, which I understood the, the validity of the demand. And I actually consulted with a very uh, a good friend and former professor of mine at Georgia Tech, uh, Doug Allen, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. And Doug was uh, a professor of both uh, urban form and landscape architecture for me. And he really taught me to see cities in a different way. Um, from the smallest element to the largest scale, a sort of a, a continuum of design intention. Um, and he said, well, think of it as a tablecloth. And I had no idea what he meant by that, but I kind of played with that idea for a couple of days. And I thought, you know, the same tablecloth on a round table, or on a square table, or a rectangular table, or a tall or short table, it seems a different form. And this landscape design had to sort of drape itself onto this plaza in a way that let that primary form, that flat plane and the two voids, come through loud and clear. And in a lower register, in a softer key, come in with a landscape design um, that complemented that. And I showed him this sketch that I called abacus-like bands, a series of bands which would pick up edges, like the edge of a ramp or the edge of a pool, and then along the bands, like beads on the wires of an abacus, trees could be placed at random intervals. They would always be on axis, but they might be 10 feet apart now and then 20 feet apart for the next one. And so as you looked in one direction, you would see all these trees snap into order, forming these long, beautiful LAs. But then as you turned 90 degrees, all of a sudden that order would disappear and you would have a much more random, staggered, almost naturalistic effect to it. And I showed him the sketch, and he said, well, I would turn the band sideways uh, to follow the arc of the sun in the sky, which I think was the right move and what we did. So I came back to the jury with this quick rendering and a quick model that I built that showed the site in context, capturing that idea. And um, shortly thereafter, the design was selected in January of 2004. And we went to realize it in all of its... Um, details, both the mundane and custodian, and the, the emotional and difficult. Uh, something as simple as where would an information desk be, where would school groups be, where would the bathrooms be, to something more complex like how would the fountains function, and to something very emotionally charged like how would the names be arranged around the pools. Um, one of the first things we did was look at the waterfalls. Uh, this is Paley Park near the Museum of Modern Art, a small pocket park on 53rd Street. It would fit in this room, uh, but it's one of the most beautiful little public spaces in New York. And in it, the water is on the surface of the wall. Uh, here at the World Financial Center, there's a very different waterfall, one that f free falls over the edge of the weir. And we ended up developing a fountain design along those lines and testing it in our fountain consultant's backyard in Toronto uh, to test it both during the winter and the summer. 
and we'd have tested different profiles and serrations for the edge of the weir, and each shape and density of lines had a, a different effect on the appearance of the water. And it's not something that you can do at a half scale, you had to do it at a full scale to see the behavior of the water as it fell 30 feet. And we came up with a design that's quite beautiful and simple. Uh, about, half, about an inch of water goes over the top of that weir, and then the geometry of these weir fingers kind of separates the water into individual streams. Uh, and each line is very clearly delineated as it falls off the edge of that weir. But by the time that water falls halfway down the weir, the clarity of each individual line disappears, and these streams kind of weave themselves together to form this moving tapestry of water. And there's an opportunity here through the design process, through investigation, to take an idea that was there all along of highlighting both individual and collective loss and to give it form. And to me, design is a very rewarding process in that way. Design is not just the finished product. And it's not just the idea that you have at the beginning. It's that whole process from initial idea through the investigation and elaboration of that idea to uh, the end of that process. Um, we also looked at the development of materials for the name panel. Um, I was very much drawn to, to bronze for its uh, outdoor statuary qualities, and we looked at both raised letters and recessed letters, and we looked at the quality of and clarity of views from the memorial gallery out past that waterfall to views of the city beyond. In this case, our fountain consultant's pool, but you know, you'd have to imagine the, the towers of New York beyond. Um, here is a view uh, at night uh, with the waterfalls themselves illuminated. This photograph uh, was on the cover of the Daily News back in uh, 2006, captured for me um, what I had hoped the memorial galleries would be, which was a quiet, reverent uh, space for contemplation. Um, and for a variety of reasons, having to do with security concerns, having to do with budgetary concerns, having to do with other projects which were competing for uh, attention on the site, the memorial galleries were eliminated from the project in 2006. And I was asked to find a way to bring the names from the galleries up to plaza level. Now, as I had said, I had always talked about the site uniting very disparate elements here, this notion of bringing both uh, to simplify life and death together side by side onto the plaza to allow um, these things to coexist and to, um, to reflect and refract off of each other daily. However, nonetheless, I still had them separated by some 30 feet from one level to the next. And here I was asked to bring it up to plaza level and I found myself standing, sort of, sort of, not just metaphorically, but physically at the edge of this abyss, wondering what would we do here. Here I am at one of the mock-ups, of the many mock-ups that we had built out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard to test different ideas. And over the next two years, under a tremendous amount of pressure and scrutiny and acrimony and uh, public demands that uh, what's taking so long, why is the memorial delayed, what are the... What are the plans for the memorial? Uh, we tried to develop a series of different uh, approaches for how we would bring the names up to plaza level. One of the first things we did is the idea that the plaza would end and the water table would begin co-planar with it and then the water would cascade down into the void, a sort of a continuous and uninterrupted flat line. And the only thing that would break that surface would be the letters of the names coming through that surface. Uh, we pursued this direction for quite a while. The water began at a shallow in depth and then made its way to a, a deeper depth. In a way, we had submerged the guardrail that was required here uh, and hid it underwater. But in doing so, we created a water feature that uh, in the minds of some uh, attorneys uh, posed a drowning hazard. And so um, we were sent back to the drawing board after a year of investigation which is incredibly frustrating, and you can imagine all the effort, all the emotional and, and uh, work effort that goes into developing each one of these proposals. All right. And so I thought, okay, our next proposal will come to that height above water or without water. And we developed another design in which the water actually welled up and out of the top of this uh, element that would ring the voids water would fall, cascade into the void on one side, 
And then on the other side, tiny little rivulets would come out. It was almost as if this water feature gestured loudly in one direction and whispered quietly in the other. Uh, and here you see this notion of these little rivulets of water coming across the names. And this option too, after a lot of discussion, was uh, d uh, d dismissed. Uh, some felt the form was too aggressive at the corners, and we were sent back to the drawing board again and again. And it was a very difficult and frustrating process, as you can imagine. There was a lot of competition uh, between people who should be working together on the development of different alternatives. But I think that process enriched the design and informed what we ended up with in a way that we could not have ended up where we did with a very successful solution if we had not gone through those iterations. And the design as it was completed includes an eight foot wide water table that is about two feet tall. And then floating above it is a bronze wing-like element. And the names are incised into this very thick steel plate they appear as shadows during the day. They're really about the absence of the material that has been removed. And these, these bronze elements are illuminated from within at night, and the names appear as light. If there was one item that was more controversial and charged with emotion than anything else that, we were, that I was involved in, it would have been the names arrangement. Um, how would the names be arranged? And would there be any hierarchy? Would there be any order? Uh, would there be, uh, how would you address one name relative to another name? Uh, we had about 400 first responders who perished in the attack in the effort to save others. And there was a demand that we recognize that heroism, the fact that these people rushed into the towers to help others and died in that effort. Uh, in the meantime, we had people who said, you know, it would be wrong to, to segregate, um, uh, to create a wall of heroes on one side of the memorial and a wall for everybody else on the other side. Uh, different proposals were made. I suggested, for example, an insignia next to some names to suggest a first responder, the symbol of the FDNY appears next to one of the names here, and what I thought was a scale and a material that was similar enough to everything else around there to not create an undue hierarchy. But as soon as that symbol appeared, somebody suggested that I was saying uh, that gold stars would appear next to some names and not others. Uh, and so there is this whole, um, you know, you have to understand the, the fear and apprehension that many people had about this process. I mean, there were dozens and dozens of groups that represented hundreds and literally thousands of different family members. Um, and I suggested something that I called meaningful adjacency, that there would be a reason for why one name would be next to another. And that idea was that we would query the family members, ask them, is there the name of somebody else who perished that day that you would like to see the name of your loved one next to? Uh, and that idea felt equitable to me in the sense that it gave everybody equal opportunity to inform the design of, and the arrangement of the names. Uh, and when I made that suggestion in early 2004 to the LMDC, it was rejected out of hand as being uh, too complex to implement. And I was asked to come up with another way of arranging the names. And I could not come up with another way that felt fair and equitable that wouldn't inadvertently favor the arrangement of some names over others. Even something as simple as an alphabetical arrangement would place some names close together and separate other names which rightfully should be together. Family members who did not share the same last name, while it might bring together people who were not family members but did share the same last name. We had three Michael Lynches on this memorial. And if we just showed their names with no distinction, there wouldn't be no way to distinguish the marker that separated one from another. Um, and so I suggested a random array of names, that we would make no effort to arrange names but let them fall where they may. And it was a very difficult suggestion to make because I knew that families that might have traveled together on the plane, people that worked together that should have been listed together would not be together under such an arrangement. But with a heavy heart, I suggested that because it felt like the only equitable idea that I could come up with. Um, and if I was unhappy with it, you can imagine how family members reacted to it. They were furious. They felt it added insult to injury. And for two years, all fundraising for the memorial and private fundraising was a very important part of uh, the funding for the memorial came to a complete and total standstill. Uh, in the meantime, opposing proposals for how the names should be arranged were um, 
put forward. And a group of family members actually suggested uh, that the names should be arranged, as you see on the top panel here, according to place of employment. And that place of employment should be listed alphabetically, company A followed by company B. And within the company, the names would be listed alphabetically along with the age and the floor upon at which they work. And so we mocked this up just to show people what this looks like. It looked more like a building directory than a memorial. And I understood the fears and the concerns that people had. They wanted something that was important to them, but, um, but I feared that this would not do that, that that would actually, instead of uniting people, what was important to me was to both emphasize the individuality of each loss and also mark on the collective nature on this loss. And by grouping people by employers like this, it actually took away from the individuality and from the collective nature by balkanizing it into smaller and smaller groups of people. Um, when Mayor Bloomberg became chairman of the Memorial Foundation in 2006, late 2006, this was one of the first issues that he wanted to tackle. Uh, for him, it was very important to raise the funds for the memorial, and he knew that this was what was preventing this from being resolved. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, what a Bloomberg terminal looks like, but it is all about data. I mean, and the mayor is a very data-driven guy. And so when I met with him uh, and the deputy mayor, Perry, Patty Harris, to go over this, he had a, a list of questions which were very detailed about, well, if you do this, if you try to sort the names by this measure, what happens? If you include this information or not that information, what happens? And out of that long conversation uh, came the idea of sorting the names geographically by where people were that day. So we have nine groups, nine group markers on the memorial panels, which mark the four flights, the two towers in the Pentagon, the 93 bombing victims who died near the North Tower footprint in 1993 on the first attack there, and the first responders. And the first responders, in turn, are grouped by where they came from, from the same firehouse, from the same police station. But within these groups, and some of these groups have over a thousand names in them, there, it appears as if they are not arranged in any order. The mayor was willing to give me the opportunity to try meaningful adjacencies, and it was remarkable for a politician to do that. Uh, the potential for mishap here was great. Nobody has ever done this before. We did not know how many people would ask for a meaningful adjacency request, nor did we know how we would be able to meet these requests, other than knowing that we wanted to create the opportunity to meet as many of these requests as possible. So you have the classic situation where, let's say we got 100 requests and we were able to meet 50 of them, we would now have 50 people that would feel that the other 50 people got something that they didn't get. Uh, so most politicians would never accede to a request like this, yet somehow he gave us the green light. And in 2009, letters went out to family members asking them to verify how they would like the name of their loved one to appear on the memorial, whether it was an initial, a full middle name, a nickname, and whether they would like any other names to be adjacent. We asked for, that they list no more than three names. Some people listed up to eight or nine names that they asked to be adjacent. Um, and it's sort of uh, beware of what you wish for. We got over 1,200 responses back. And as you can see, this was due back uh, to us in late 2009. The memorial had to open in 2011. So we had to take all of this information, synthesize it into a coherent graphic design of how the names would appear on the panels while meeting as many of these requests as possible, fabricate and install these panels, all with a very tight schedule. Um, and we were able to do that, <laughs> which uh, took a tremendous amount of work. In fact, one of the pools, the South Pool, was arranged entirely by hand by one woman in our office, which arranged them again and again and again until we found uh, the arrangement that both met the requests but also looked visually correct. We didn't want any breaks from the top to the bottom. If you look at the memorial panels, you'll see that except at the corners, there are five rows of names, so any name might have a name to its right and left, maybe above or below or both. And so finding a way to arrange these uh, names to meet these requests um, had both uh, the aspects of a visual puzzle, but also a lot, an emotional uh, puzzle. And I think um, it was very important for us to do this. Uh, and most people that visit the memorial are not aware that this effort went into the design. Uh, they do not know why one name is next to another. They see the major groups, but they don't see the, the hidden relationships that exist within these groups between one name and another. And there are different ways to share that information with them. Uh, we have uh, 
an app that people can look on their phone and see the connections. Um, there's a group called StoryCorps that has recorded some oral histories and some of those are available to listen to when you stand in front of a particular panel. There might be a printed brochure. There are many different ways that that information can be teased back out once it's been embedded in there. And I think it's important to do that because um, it can be overwhelming to come to the memorial and to see close to 3,000 names. It can become almost an abstraction. But when you focus on one history, on uh, the events um, in the life of a person that connected them to the names around them, it's very powerful and personal, and it's a window, an opportunity to, to connect and to, to relate to people. And I think it's important to do that, especially at a site like this that tried to dehumanize um, the loss of life, to, to desensitize us to it. Um, one of the, and as we arranged the names, we learned of some of the stories behind these requests, and some of them seemed unimaginable. One of them was from a young woman who lost her father, who was on Flight 11, and lost her best friend from university, who was working in the North Tower. And Flight 11 actually crashed into the North Tower, so his name is one of the last names under the grouping Flight 11. Her name is one of the first ones under World Trade Center at the North Tower. And when that family visits the memorial, I think it's very meaningful to them to see those two names side by side. But when I tell you this story, it's a way for you to connect to the suffering of this one woman, to understand what happened, the impact of what happened on that day just to her. And I think every time one visits the memorial, there's the opportunity to, to connect to another story, to, to see, to understand the events of that day through somebody else's eyes, through somebody else's voice. So it looked like we were finally marching towards completion on schedule when the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities approached us and said, the design is not equally accessible to people that are seated in wheelchairs. They cannot see the shorter people who are seated in wheelchairs, I should say, cannot see the void at the center of each pool, this void that you see barely in the image on the screen. Um, and uh, we were asked to, to find a way to address that. And we tried to modify the geometry of the panel to create openings that would allow somebody of a shorter stature who is seated in a wheelchair to see through. But as you can see, these attempts were kind of uh, clunky. They felt like they were done after the fact. They, they, they weren't part of the, the DNA of the design, so to speak. And in many ways, as a designer, you enter into dialogue with the project. It has its own voice, its own identity, and it's your, pro your responsibility to, to respect that and to find a way to, to engage in that voice. Um, and uh, you can imagine there is a lot of pressure uh, for us to move forward very quickly and find a solution. And a lot of bad ideas were sort of thrown on the table at that moment. Some people suggested that a portion of the plaza might have a scissor lift on it that would go up and down so that if you were seated in a wheelchair, it could elevate you up. Other people said, could you make these panels out of glass here and there so that you could see through them? And again, none of these were organic to the nature of the design. And um, it was people like Amanda Burden, our city planning commissioner, and Kate Levin, our cultural commissioner in New York City, who represented Mayor Bloomberg um, in this effort that gave us the time, uh, not a lot of time, but the time to respond uh, creatively and um, correctly to this demand. And what we ended up doing is chamfering the corner instead of coming to a 90 degree corner, as you see you know, down here, a 90 degree corner, we sort of cut the corner and had two 45 degree turns. Um, and what that did, it brought viewers closer to the edge of the weir. And you can see that by doing that, we allowed people uh, that were seated in a wheelchair to, to see that void at the center of each pool. We came back to uh, the Mayor's Office of People with Disability very uh, satisfied with our ingenuity. They said, if you're seated in a wheelchair and you roll up to the edge of the corner and you look over your shoulder, you can see the void. And they said, well, not everybody is capable of turning their head sideways. At that point, you know, you feel like pulling every last hair out of your head. And, you know, here we are, we found a solution. And um, we said, okay, let's figure this out. Instead of just cutting it in plan, we'll also cut it in sections. So the corner come, projects out, almost like the, the bow of the ship. And um, I'd like 
to share this story because it was one of many demands that was made on the design of this process. And it was a series of constraints that we did not welcome when we first were, when they were first imposed upon us. But I think design and architecture are always uh, an exercise in dealing with constraints. And every project has a constraint of uh, time and budget. And other projects have other constraints associated with them, some of them quite emotional and difficult, some of them having to do with accessibility. Um, but because of the, these constraints, and because we were given the opportunity to respond creatively and not just come up with the first viable solution that would answer this demand, but a solution that would be in the, the nature of this project, we were able to actually improve the project overall. The corner sculpturally is much more beautiful than what we had initially, and now the names flow without pause around all around the pools, whereas before they stopped and started at the corners. <laughs> So poetically and sculpturally and from an accessible view, the project improved as a result of that. Um, a few images of the design and fabrication process, the investigation of different materials and the testing of these materials at full-scale mock-ups that really enabled us to make modifications before uh, the final panels were fabricated. and. Um, erected on the site, and a few images, uh, you know, of the plaza, of the trees as they were assembled um, in these giant baskets uh, for a few years off-site until we were ready to receive them, uh, some pictures of the construction process before and during. You could see the North Pool being formed here, a portion of the South Pool here. Uh, but what looks like uh, uh, an urban plaza in the middle of the city is in fact uh, a green roof over a very complicated set of programs here. Below the plaza is a subway line running under Greenwich, a train running to New Jersey underneath the plaza, a chiller plant that draws water in from the Hudson River, uh, pump rooms, back of house spaces, a memorial museum, a retail concourse. But all of that complexity is intentionally suppressed. And what you see when you're up here, it feels as if you're standing on solid ground because it is really a place for, for a public space for gathering, for, for looking back to the past, for seeing what is no longer here. Um, and all of that was done in anticipation of letting the public back in here. I think everything that we did was sort of half, you know, it was like setting the stage and then the actors came on the stage, and the actors are you and me and everybody else that comes and populates the site. And so as you come to the site, even if you come alone, you're not there alone. You're there in the presence of others, and that's very important. Um, so some images, some of these are, the trees have grown even bigger since this picture was taken. The tower has been completed. But the dedication ceremony was an incredible, powerful day because uh, that day was open only to family members and since then it's been open to the public. And the last year, uh, construction fences around us have come down and now it's open to the public at all times. This picture of these young girls running around and this picture of this father who just found the name of his son were taken the morning of the dedication ceremony and they're both incredibly powerful pictures to me. Taken side by side, a few minutes apart, a few feet apart. But to me, it's important that both of these things happen on this one site at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Our, and uh, please, uh, we will be happy if you are make commentaries or ask questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, you may speak at the microphone, just press the button. Or Hi. just speak while you're loud enough. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask if you have uh, had uh, an opportunity to observe the life of the monument. Is there any public events held or, uh, I don't know, or how people behave in this space? Are they cheerful or uh, do they really notice the memorial? Yeah, there's a whole range of behaviors that I've witnessed. I mean, when it comes to ceremonies, obviously, uh, 
once a year there's a commemoration ceremony that occurs at the site and that is very um, almost ritualized in a sense. There's been the ringing of the bell it's every year to mark when the towers were struck and when they fell down. There's been the reading of the names and so over the last 12, 13 years the a ceremony for commemoration at the site has emerged and uh, um, and I've seen it changed, uh, changed a little bit over the years, but you can also see that connective thread. Uh, as I was saying, until about a year ago, because of the construction around us, access to the site was limited to those that got a time ticket, went through security. Um, a year ago, these fences came down, and now people can just walk up to the site, and you, see, you can start to see people that are using it on their way from point A to point B, and people that are there to, to linger, to see the memorial, people that are very emotional, and other people that are posing for pictures with friends and taking selfies. So I think you have the full, the full range. Um, the two of the office towers that are being built around us, two have just opened. One of them opened literally two weeks ago, Tower One. Um, Condé Nast is moving into that building. It's a big publication house. Uh, Tower 4 opened recently too, and some it has a few tenants. And last time I was there, I saw somebody sitting on a bench eating their lunch. So uh, you're starting to see that. I would say that right now, the overwhelming number of people who are there are tourists, who are there to see it um, as part of the, the destinations that they come to see in New York. But I think over time, that's going to change and evolve. You'll start to see more people who work in this neighborhood, who who live in this neighborhood, it's become a more residential neighborhood. There are more people actually residing in Lower Manhattan now than there were before the attacks. A lot of the older office buildings there have been turned into apartment buildings. Um, to me, it's important for it to be part of the life of New York again and to see that, that full range of, of behaviors and emotions. I think there are some behaviors which would be wrong to happen there, and I'm sure that 99% of the population um, recognizes that and knows, uh, you know, how to respond to that. Every once in a while there will be people that, that behave differently in a way that's not appropriate. But I don't think we should design our spaces based on that uh, benchmark. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hamza, do you have uh, any um, memorial monuments from the, the 20th century in mind that uh, Well, I, I was showing you the, the design process that I engaged in, um, which began with that sketch for those memorials in the river, or for those voids in the river. So, and I would have to say that the two ideas that underpin the design for me, uh, the two most important ideas, are that notion of making absence uh, visible and tangible, and of making a public space. Um, and so those two things are at the heart of the design. Like any designer and any architect, I'm of course influenced by the many precedents in urban form and architecture and history that I've seen. And I think some of those uh, range from, you know, uh, the sort of the, uh, I'm trying to find the right word here, the sort of the severe quality of some spaces. It could be, you know, in Toltec pyramids, in, like near Chichen Itza to something as recent as what Maya Lin did in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So I think, um, to me, uh, I've grown up in large cities with, with long histories. I grew up in Jerusalem as well as other cities. And so you see these spaces which have uh, an emotional resonance over millennia. And there's something that is almost separate from the architectural language. It's more, um, uh, it seems to operate at a deeper level than that, uh, which uh, carries a sort of spiritual uh, resonance. And I, I, I'm hoping, you know, the jury is still out on that for a very long time, that some of that is captured in this design here. Thank you. Of the, of the 
it's a monument uh, 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 you make this idea of uh, uh, several months uh, before the tragedy and uh, not before the tragedy uh, right after yeah yes and uh, uh, when your conception had been shown to Libeskind and how uh, what was his reaction? Used, used it uh, uh, when he planned uh, the reconstruction of uh, a... Um I can't speak for Daniel Liebskin. I do know that, you know, I think the proposal that I put together respected some of the elements of the master plan, um, like the idea of connectivity to the city while challenging others. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet with him and uh, discuss some of these issues. Um, and he's come to to embrace the the proposal um, and a pre and see in it what uh, some of his intentions were for the master plan. But I think in some ways it did challenge the master plan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? You're welcome. Thank you. Let me just say that I hope we are all impressed, like me, with Michael's talk. And especially, let me, uh, let me tell you my personal opinion, was that uh, process of negotiations between different groups of people, institutions, uh, regarding the planning of the monument, yeah, and that respect of, the, of you and the, your team uh, to the demands of all this group, and that Long story about the arrangement of names for me was especially touching. For we have names listed in our monuments, but normally, as you remember, they are listed alphabetically in a rather dull way. And here, that very sensitive ideas and sensitive reaction to what people are supposed to expect from the designers. Uh, gives us, I believe, it, even to those who are not familiar with America and American thinking, that very uh, important understanding of the place for an individual in the society, or at least how the society wants to see this place. I wasn't able yet to visit the memorial, and I love New York, and Unfortunately, I haven't been there for a relatively long time, but mm -hmm. trust me, it was one of the first places where I go now. Uh, but I was in Washington, D.C., and I saw the Vietnam Memorial, uh, which is extremely touching. And I happened to be there uh, in the Veterans Day. It was mm -hmm. my first coming to America, so I felt myself rather alienated and strange with all that bunch of bearded men and camouflage. <laughs> uh, visited that second place and you know at that it was a moment of discovery of America for me and I but now I, I would say that I do hope that your your memorial will not suffer that addition of figurative sculpture which uh, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington DC unfortunately mm -hmm. suffered. But that minimalist but very safe, well calculated and well thought years old that the memorial for my for, for me gives very very good idea of how memory could be introduced, incorporated to that living city. But this is what is very dear to me and uh, I must thank uh, Michael thank you. personally. Thank you. And I hope you will come again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.